next Sunday at this time. It will not be at this time, at least not for me. I take off Tuesday night to go to Manila in the Philippines, and they are 15 hours ahead. So if all goes well, uh, as you meet here, I will have already finished speaking at a church there, and I should be in bed, and it should actually be Monday morning. Um, but it should be a good time. I'll be there speaking in a couple churches and then taking part in a pastor's conference. Three of us are acting as speakers at that conference, about 250 Filipino pastors. So if you think of us over the next uh, week or two and could pray, I'd sure appreciate it. Uh, next Sunday, Pastor Mike Jones is going to be here filling the pulpit. And uh, the following Sunday, uh, Pastor Britt is going to have some very special guests joining us. So uh, you will not want to miss that. Uh, as I've been thinking about our topic today, I got thinking about etymology. You know what etymology is? That's the study of where words come from, how we get the words that we have. And there's a lot of uh, really cool history when you start delving into where do certain words come from. For instance, the word clue. Did you know the word clue didn't even exist until the mid-1500s, and even then it was because of a misspelling. It comes from an earlier word, clue, which was spelled C-L-E-W. And that word, in turn, comes from uh, Latin and goes all the way back to Greek mythology. And where it went in Greek mythology was the character Theseus, who went into the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur. If you know the labyrinth, it was this giant maze-like thing in mythology. And when Theseus went into the labyrinth, to be sure he could find his way back out, he took with him a clue, a ball of string. And he unwound the string as he went into the labyrinth so he could then follow the string to get back out. And along the way, that idea of following something to find your way through it came to take on the idea of looking for pieces in a puzzle, and eventually it got misspelled, and we ended up with our word today of clue. So you look for a clue, you're really looking for a ball of string. Or, I love this one, the word mortgage. The word mortgage comes from two old French words. The first, mort, means dead, and the second one, gage, means pledge. So it's a pledge until you're dead. <laughs> Think on these things. Or, to prove that cynicism is nothing new, the word nice comes from an old Latin word that means ignorant. So if you're being nice, you're just not very bright, apparently was what the, yeah. Well, a couple other Latin words I got thinking about this week. Word communis, which is a noun, and the verb communicare. Uh, both of them have the idea of something that is common or shared or making something common or shared. And these form the roots of some words that we're very familiar with, words like community or communication. In both those cases, we have this idea of living in a shared space, in shared relationships, or sharing words that allow us to, in turn, share in relationship with other people. Uh, Alto Nepal, a blogger, says this. It says, communities are formed with the tie of communication. It is the foundation of community. Hence, where there is no communication, there can't be a community. Community doesn't happen simply because you're in proximity with people. It happens because there is some kind of sharing, some kind of communication that occurs between you. I had the experience years ago of uh, being on campus at Biola University during the summer, and they were hosting different groups that would come in for seminars. Um, I was waiting in line to get lunch when I realized that I had no one to talk to, even though everybody appeared to be talking. The reason was, it was a deaf convention. And everybody around me was signing away furiously and having a great time together, but I couldn't communicate. And so even though I was surrounded by people, there was no sense that I was part of a community. They certainly had a sense of community, but I wasn't part of it because there was no communication. We've been talking these last few weeks about what is it that constitutes real church growth? And communis is not only at the root of our English words, it is at the root of the church. 
What makes the church the church is that we are a communist. We are a community that are called to share life together. I've said this numerous times. Real church growth is not just about counting seats. It's not how many people are in the building. It's not how much square footage is in the building. That is not the real metric of church growth. Real church growth is about real spiritual growth that is happening within the community of Jesus' followers. We've looked at some elements of that. We've talked about sharing our faith out loud, being willing to be a witness to our friends and neighbors that are not yet followers of Jesus, to invite them to consider his claims that maybe they too would be drawn and called to be his followers. We've talked about Bible study and the importance that we are regularly spending time in God's word because it is a foundational document for the Christian life. If you're an American citizen, we have some foundational documents, don't we? We have the Declaration of Independence. We have the Bill of Rights. We have the U.S. Constitution. These, these things give shape to what it means to be an American. Well, likewise, to be a Christian, to understand how that community is shaped and what we're all about means that we need to be people who are in God's Word, who are in Scripture. And so that's an important part of real church growth. Last week, I had fun with coffee beans. We talked about the fact that you can have a big jar full of coffee beans, but you still don't have the makings for a great cup of coffee. It's only when those beans finally get out of their shells, they go through the mixer a little bit, they get ground up and mixed up, that suddenly you have what can make for a great cup of coffee. And by the same token, the fact that we just come and sit in a building together for an hour or two on a Sunday morning is not what makes real community. There has to be a getting outside of ourselves and allowing our lives to intersect with others for real community to happen. John Stott has said this, We are not only committed to Christ, we are also committed to the body of Christ. I trust that none of my readers is that grotesque anomaly, an unchurched Christian. The New Testament knows nothing of such a person. The church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. It is not a divine afterthought. It is not an accident of history. On the contrary, the church is God's new community. And we talked last week about the fact that just being busy in the church isn't the answer either. Because sometimes we get busy in the church, but the reason we're busy is we're somehow trying to earn God's favor. I was at a friend's funeral some time ago, and there was a group of people standing around talking about this person, and just what a really great person they had been, the good things they had done, and and someone said, thinking about being prepared for death, well, that's what we work for all our lives, isn't it? In other words, that's what it's all about, right? We work really hard because we hope that someday when we die, maybe God will be happy with us and he'll let us in heaven. And the message of the cross is, this is not something we earn. Salvation is a gift that God gives to us. We come to him with our brokenness, with our sin, and God in grace forgives us and makes us part of his family. And we then serve, we enter into community not to earn God's favor, but out of gratitude to live out the relationship that he has called us to. Today I want to think about another aspect of communication, specifically communication with God, prayer. And especially prayer together. You know, the church was launched in a prayer meeting. If you go back to the earliest days of the church, Jesus, when he left earth, and his disciples are wondering, what do we do next? Here's what it says in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. The apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance of half a mile, When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer. When you don't know what else to do, pray. Even when you're sure you know what else to do, pray. They were constantly united in prayer. Well, the outcome of that, what we know is the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in a powerful way. There were signs and wonders. The Apostle Peter preached this amazing message, and 3,000 people put faith in Jesus Christ that day. The church is launched. Acts 2 tells us what that new church did. 
The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. From day one, when the church shaped up and came into being, prayer was one of the foundational things that they did together. Well, of course, as the church got going, they ran into opposition. Much of the Jewish leadership was very opposed to this new following of Jesus. In fact, they arrested them, and they ordered Peter and others that they were not to preach, to, to stop talking in Jesus' name. Here's what Acts 4 says. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. This is just their reflexive action. When problems arise and God's people are together, what they do is they pray. Well, the persecution continued. Peter was again arrested. Acts 12 tells us that while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. The result of that prayer is that God, in a miraculous way, delivered Peter from prison. When Peter gets out, it says that he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. They had kept on praying. When Peter got out of prison, he knew exactly where to go to find his friends. He knew that they would be together and they would be praying for him. The, the funny end of that story is that when, when Peter gets there, here's this big prayer meeting, praying for me released, and he shows up. The girl that answers the door is so stunned that she shuts the door, leaves him standing outside, and goes tells everybody else, hey, guess what? Peter's here. We're kind of like that sometimes. God actually answers prayer, and we don't know what to do. When you get into Paul's letters, you find that he regularly speaks of his own prayers for the churches, and he also exhorts them to continue praying for each other. So the question is, why pray together? I have to make some confessions. They are the confessions of a bored child. My parents sought to engage us in prayer when I was little. A lot. They took us to adult prayer meetings every week, which were very long. And the pews were very hard. And the topics were very boring. And I sat there for hour after hour. And that's probably a reason why to this day when people talk about prayer meetings, I have to be honest and say there's a little piece in me that goes, okay, I can do that. We also had family devotions every night, which is a good thing. And we had a family altar. We, we'd kneel at the couch and pray. But again, that could go on for a long time. And when you're five, six, seven years old, and your little brother is next to you, he's a little younger, and you're a little distracted, and you're a little bored, pretty soon one of you kind of elbows the other one. And then we discovered this game, leg wrestling, where while you're kneeling, you can put your leg over the other guy, and then he tries to get you back, and who can pin who? which was a lot of fun until I felt my father's hand on my shoulder, kind of clamping down, reminding me that we were supposed to be in God's presence, not wrestling. Um, but you know, there also was a lot of good in that. I learned a lot of good things praying with adults. I had some wonderful experiences learning, even as a child, how to express my heart to God. But Maybe it's because there's kind of that mixed bag in my background that I've given quite a bit of thought over the years to how people can pray better together. It's, it's tough to change course because we all get into certain ruts in our prayer life. And, and in group prayer, we all get into some ruts. And nobody wants to be the one mid-prayer meeting to stand up and say, you know what, this is really boring. I think we're doing something wrong. So we'll talk about that more later. I think, though, that it's important to pray together because praying together does several things. One of the things that praying together does is it, uh, it builds unity. It's kind of like huddling in a football game. You know, the players all know the plays, and, and some teams will, will run those kinds of offenses where they don't huddle. They just go straight to the line, and it's to keep the other, their opponents off base. But nobody can do that through the entire game. And, and most teams don't use that strategy because 
there's something they gain, not just in knowing what play is coming next, but there's something about getting together, even for those few brief moments, that helps to unite the team, encourage them, keep them going. I think likewise, coming together as a huddle, as believers together to pray together, builds unity. It is encouraging. It draws our hearts together. I think it also broadens our communication with God. Because I get into my own ruts. I get into my own kind of favorite prayers, my own prayer requests, my own phrases, whatever. And, and sometimes just hearing someone else pray, it gives me fresh perspective. I, I hear new words, new language. I, I think about other aspects of the request that I hadn't even thought of before because I'm listening to someone else share their heart. Their heart. It also gives insight because as we listen to each other in prayer, we get a glimpse into someone else's soul. When our kids were little, I often learned a lot about what my children were thinking by listening to them talking to someone else. I think in the same way, there is something special about getting to hear someone else share their heart with God, letting me into that, that little bit of their spirit, their relationship with him. I think that that in turn can enrich our own prayer life. If group prayer is structured in such a way that it's not boring, it, it in fact becomes stimulating. It's like pushing embers together to stoke up a fire. It can even be educational. Sometimes there are young Christians that this whole experience of praying out loud with other people is kind of a new and slightly weird thing. But as they sit with older believers, as they find out that it's okay, it's safe, we can talk to God together, they begin to grow and grow in their comfort in that way as well. And I think that praying together creates an atmosphere where God's Spirit often seems pleased to move. Great revivals in the church through the years have so often started out of prayer meetings. As people have prayed together, united themselves, and God has moved. Now, there are some of you that are just waiting for me to put Matthew 18, 20 up on the screen because it's your favorite verse, and it's just all about this, right? So to, to not keep you in suspense any longer, here it is, Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. That just says it all, doesn't it? It would if that's what that verse is saying. So I'm going to ruin the day for a few of you, but I'm sorry. If we're going to talk about good Bible study habits, one of the things you have to do when you study the Bible is be sure you know what the Bible is saying. And this is one of those verses that gets pulled out of context a lot. And not because the concept is wrong, but because if you think that this is just talking about whether or not God shows up at a prayer meeting, uh, it's just bad theology can make you ask all kinds of weird questions, like, uh, is God not present if we pray alone? Um, are prayers more effective if there's only three of us as opposed to if there's six of us? What if we pray over the phone? Does that count? Because we haven't really gotten together. Does God count that? Okay, that's just bad theology. So what is it that Matthew 18 is really talking about? Well, here we go. Let's jump back to verse 15. Jesus talking, he says, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Okay, what's Jesus talking about? Conflict, right? Trying to win someone back when there's been a conflict, a break in the relationship, an offense. Next verse. But if you're unsuccessful, Take one or two others with you. Now you're taking witnesses. There are now two or three of you together. Go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. I would take that meaning to the church leadership. And if he or she won't accept the church's decision, Treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. In other words, if they just refuse all attempts at mediation, at, at arriving at a, a fair and a kind answer, he says, well, it's okay to just close the proceedings here, okay? I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. He's talking about authority that, that is, rests within the community of the church. 
I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. What's he talking about? He's talking about agreeing together on, on a course of action, perhaps even discipline over this conflict. Because where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. The verse is actually talking about conflict resolution, not prayer meetings. Now, some of you are very sad that I did that. Let me just assure you the Bible is all for us praying together. And it says that clearly other places, like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. 1 Thessalonians 5, always be joyful, never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. So how do you get involved in prayer, in praying together at Dungeness Community Church? I'm going to ask two ladies to come and join me, my wife, Burnett, and Colleen Price, who's our care coordinator. And uh, Burnett, you have had a real heart for prayer for several years. Maybe just briefly describe what that journey has been like for you. Okay. I think since I was a kid, I just prayer was important to me and growing up in a Christian home. But uh, a few years ago, the Lord especially tapped me on the shoulder to start a regional prayer endeavor. And along with that, he really spoke to my heart individually about the importance of prayer. And it just became even more personal and even deeper to me. So, Great. Yeah. So if someone wants to start praying with others, how can they do that here? Yeah, there's lots of ways. Uh, first of all, our life groups, our small groups. Many of you are probably part of a home group or some kind of small group. And I'm pretty sure most of them, if not all, incorporate prayer into their times together. So that's a good way. Um, we also have a prayer meeting every Sunday morning from 930 to 1030 over in the conference room in the chapel building. And that's a time when we gather and pray for our church, the churches in the area, our region and our global workers. So that's a good time to pray and together. Where is that conference room? And that's at the end of the hall in the chapel building, which is across across the way over there. Um, another way is we have um, twenty four seven prayer. We have joined with other churches in the area, in which we commit to one day a month. And not that you can't pray other times, but it's just kind of a tool that we pick a day to pray. And DCC's day is the fourth Sunday of the month, and Actually, after service today, if you haven't had a chance to sign up and you'd like to, you can sign up for a time slot to pray on that day. And Nancy Hardy will be out in the foyer afterwards to help you with that. But it's just an endeavor where Tim was talking about unity. We, we join with other churches to pray for our region. And it also is an encouragement as we get together to um, hold up the things of our church in our area. Um, Part of that 24-7 prayer is a Tuesday prayer call. Every Tuesday at noon, we have an hour-long prayer call that is facilitated by a gal from a church in our area. And we usually lift up two areas of our region, for example, health care, business, education, and we, we lift up a couple of those each time, and then we lift up a city on the peninsula, too. And so someone just calls in yeah. to the number and becomes part of that conference If you go call. to peninsulaprayer.com, you can find the phone number or you can talk to me. And there's a phone number and an access code. And then another way is we have special events once in a while. This summer we had Celebrate His Light, and it was a half day of prayer where we got together. And I have a book here called Praising, the green book. And um, let me hold that up. It's, it's creative ways to pray, and Tim's going to be talking about that later, but the prayer times that I've been facilitating recently, ha we have singing, we have scripture reading, we pray the scripture, we do a lot of different things to make it not boring. That's good. <laughs> and Colleen, uh, one of the things that we have is a prayer chain. What is that all about? 
Yes, so um, the prayer chain, a lot of you will remember the old version of prayer chains where you would get a call, you would hear about a prayer request that was coming in, you'd pick up the phone and call the next person and so on and so forth. We now have that um, with technology, we can do that via email, and so when the prayer requests come into the church or to myself directly or one of the pastors, I'm able to send that out in email form to, we've got a group of 89 people now on that group, um, so that they can pray for those prayer requests when they're coming in. If somebody wants to be part of the prayer chain to pray for people, how do they get involved? Give me a call. I'd love to put your name on the list. Um, just like any of our other ministries, we do ask that you've been part of our congregation for at least six months. Um, when you give me a call, we talk through the guidelines. Most important, of course, is that anything that comes in has to be kept confidential. Okay, and if someone has a prayer request, how do they get that on the prayer chain? You can either email that to prayer at dcchurch.org. It's also in your bulletin. You can write it on a welcome card and drop it back in one of the offering boxes. Um, or you can email me directly. You can call the office. They come in to me many different ways. Um, so I'm watching for those throughout the week. All right. Thank you both very much. And just by the way, for the prayer chain, if the Mariners are losing, that's actually not cause to call the prayer chain. <laughs> Just saying, we can't field that many calls. Um, <laughs> let me give you a few do's and don'ts for praying in groups. Just be real practical for a minute because we've all had these experiences in a group that it was not inspiring. So let me give you some things to not do. The first I'd say is do not be the florist. What I mean by that is, you know the person that when prayer time starts, they feel they need to present large flowery bouquets of archaic language. These and thous and great elocution of, of what they can say. It's impressive, but it kind of puts other people off. For one thing, they're not sure if they can match you for, you know, your great verbosity. Uh, we don't need a florist. We, we just need for you to pray and be real and be yourself. Something else that you want to watch out for is becoming what I'm calling the auctioneer. <laughs> you know, the auctioneer tries to cover the whole room. Every hand that pops up, he's going to call them. And maybe you've seen the person that your group shares a series of prayer requests, and the first person prays, and they pray for everything in the room, and then you're thinking, well, now what do I pray for? Everything got prayed for already. Okay? Leave room for other people. Pick one thing, pray for it, allow someone else to participate as well. Or there is the Energizer Bunny. You know, the person that just keeps going and going and going and going. Keep it short. When you pray in a group, it's not just about one person having a monologue. It is the group praying together and having a conversation with God. Along with that is the storyteller. You know, the storyteller takes the request, and then in their prayer, they feel they need to fill in all of the backstory for God. In, in great detail. And I would just remind you that we are praying to the sovereign God. He knows the backstory. And so pray about the request, but, but don't become too caught up in all the details. And then there is the mime. You know, mimes are wonderful people. They just don't say anything. And you know the people that just sit there quietly week after week after week and never say anything. Sometimes entire groups have this happen to them. And in fact, it becomes almost a contest, like who's going to break and say something first as, as everyone sits in silence waiting, right? Um, when you come together to pray, what makes group prayer dynamic is when the group prays. And sometimes we're shy. It's like, oh, I don't want to sound dumb. I don't want to say the wrong thing. You're not going to say the wrong thing. Just talk to God. It doesn't have to be long. In fact, the group will appreciate it if it's not long. It can just be short. You don't need special words. And then, finally, I would say, don't be just that guy, the guy that uses just just about all the time. Some of us have these kind of weird prayer tics, kind of annoying speech mannerisms that we wouldn't use talking to anybody else. You know what I mean? It's like, well, Lord, we're just glad that you're just here, and we're here, and we just want to bring our request because we just want you to, okay, enough with the just already. Just talk to God. <laughs> or whatever, that little repetitious phrase is that you use constantly in prayer. Those things are hard to break. I catch myself doing them. And it's like, Tim, what, what are you doing here? You don't talk to anybody else this way. Why would I talk to God this way? 
we're looking to have a real conversation. So here are some do's. First, I would say keep it short. Don't go on and on. A short request is fine. In fact, one of the nice things is don't limit yourself to one and done. It's okay for two or three people to pray about the same request and then move on, and you can pray again about another request, and two or three can pray about that one as well. It, it's, it's a dynamic conversation we're having with God. I would also say we want to keep it real. Again, don't worry about having the right words. You don't need to sound like the King James Version. Just be a real person. Uh, th- now I would also say you want to keep it moving. By that I mean come prepared to speak. Don't keep waiting for someone else. In fact, some of us need to set that mindset before we even get to our, our home Bible study group. If we know we're going to have a prayer time, I would challenge you this coming week to psychologically prepare yourself and say, this is the week that I am going to pray at the group. They are going to hear words come out of my mouth to God. If you need to, rehearse what the words will be before you get there. But as a group, pray together. And then I'd say, keep it fresh. Don't get stuck with just making lists of needs. You can take a favorite scripture read it together, and then pray about the themes that are in that scripture. Or take a hymn. Take a favorite verse from that hymn and use that as a starting point for your prayer time. Write out a prayer ahead of time and share it with the group. Maybe it's really hard for you to spontaneously know what to say. But you're a good writer. Go ahead and write and share that with the group. That is a real prayer. Sometimes finding someone else's prayer and sharing it can be good. It can be a starting point for our own prayer life. There's a book by Jonathan Aiken called Prayers for People Under Pressure. And uh, he has a couple prayers I really like. One is from the ancient church father, Augustine. Augustine prayed this, O God, my joy, my glory, and my confidence, highest, best, most mighty, most far, and yet most near, fairest and yet strongest, fixed yet incomprehensible, unchanging yet the author of all change, never new, never old. O oh Lord, I love thee. Boy, you could just pray through that phrase by phrase and there is so much to unpack in your conversation with God. Or here's another one I really like, prayed by a 17th century nun. See if you can relate to any of this prayer. Lord, thou knowest better than I know myself that I'm growing older and will someday be old. Keep me from the fatal habit of thinking I must say something on every subject and on every occasion. (laughs) Release me from craving to straighten out everybody's affairs. Make me thoughtful but not moody, helpful but not bossy. With my vast store of wisdom, it seems a pity not to use it all, but thou knowest, Lord, that I want a few friends at the end. Keep my mind free from the recital of endless details. Give me wings to get to the point. Seal my lips on my aches and pains. They are increasing, and love of rehearsing them is becoming sweeter as the years go by. I dare not ask for grace enough to enjoy the tales of others' pains, but help me to endure them with patience. I dare not ask for improved memory, but for growing humility and a lessening cocksureness when my memory seems to clash with the memories of others. Teach me the glorious lesson that occasionally I may be mistaken. (laughs) Keep me reasonably sweet. I do not want to be a saint. Some of them are so hard to live with. But a sour old person is one of the crowning works of the devil. Give me the ability to see good things in unexpected places and talents in unexpected people. And give me, O Lord, the grace to tell them so. Amen. You know, there's a lot that you can incorporate into your own prayer life in that. Again, I just want to remind you that when we pray in a group, it is a conversation. Maybe it would be good for you in your group to just place a chair there for God to remind yourselves that he's really present and you're really talking to him. And share the conversation around and everyone participate something we do in our staff meetings on Monday mornings. We have a prayer time, and uh, we have a little three-part formula. It goes like this. Pray it out, back it up, move it on. 
we don't actually take any time to share prayer requests because we figure that we can all hear just as well as God can. So we don't, we're not having like a secret meeting here and then take it to God like he doesn't know what we just said. So what we do is we just pray and pray it out. If you've got a request, pray it out. We'll hear it, God will hear it, and then we ask someone to back it up. When they're done praying about that request, someone else just jumps in and prays for that request as well and adds their two cents, if you will. And then we move it on. Someone else, maybe the person that just prayed, maybe someone else prays out something that's on their heart, and someone backs them up, and we move it on. And, and it flows. And I just want to encourage you to try doing some different things in your time as a group, praying together to make it alive and to make it real. We started by talking about the Latin word communis. It is the root for community and communication, because communicating with God together as a community of his people is important and it's beautiful. There's another word that comes from that same root, and it is the word communion. It's the term that we use to speak of the Lord's table, that Jesus, shortly before his death, took some simple elements. He broke bread and he said, this represents my body, which is broken for you. He took the wine, he took the cup, and he said, this represents my blood that is spilled for you. And he let his disciples know that they are being called into a new community as his redeemed people. And so we are going to share that together this morning, to take the bread, to take the cup. If you don't know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have not yet entered into that community, it's okay to let that go by. But I would also ask you to consider that God may be knocking on your heart. That he is inviting you to become part of his community, to have a relationship with him, not because you deserve it, but because he loves you. Because by his grace, he forgives us, he cleans us up, he gives us a new purpose, and he calls us into a new community. I love the story on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, now risen, meets up with a couple men who didn't even recognize him as they were walking. But when they did recognize him, it was when he broke the bread. It says they sat down to eat, he took the bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. My prayer is that this morning as you take the bread, as you take the cup, that God would open your eyes and you'd recognize him. You'd recognize he is right here, right among us.